I'm Kimberly Babin Marshall, curator for MCAC, McLean County Art Center. Currently on view in our newly renovated Brandt Gallery, we have an exhibition entitled Director's Choice, and these are hand-selected artworks from our director, Douglas C. Johnson, who's also a fine artist. And that background comes in quite handy when trying to put together a show like this. Uh, because the artistic vision and understanding is what ties in all of this together to create a cali uh, this caliber of an exhibition. Uh, I'm Doug Johnson, and this exhibition in the Brandt Gallery showcases both our remodeled space, but also some uh, items from our permanent collection that I selected. Uh, there's a whole lot of artwork that I'm very proud that the Art Center has, and so it was difficult decision making these selections. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, just a handful of them, and hopefully you'll be interested enough that you can do some exploration on your own. So the first piece I'll talk about is a painting by Elizabeth Stein. Those folks that went to Bloomington High School um, in the 50s and 60s were very familiar with Miss Stein. She was the high school teacher uh, for the art program, but she had an interesting backstory. She uh, apparently never cashed a single check that she received from the school district. Uh, she had uh, independent funds. Actually, she was was uh, um, well financed to the point that she was not reliant upon any income and in fact uh, used her resources in order to fund the education of quite a few students, not least of, not least of which was Elizabeth Murray, uh, Bloomington High School, class of 1956, um, who she funded to go to the Art Institute. And Elizabeth Murray ended up having a, a national reputation. Uh, I've seen her work in the National Gallery of Art and just had an amazing career before she uh, died from cancer. Actually, I met Elizabeth Murray at the memorial service at the ISU galleries for Elizabeth Stein. Uh, although she was dying of cancer, uh, Elizabeth Murray came back to pay her respects to Miss Stein. So it's an interesting painting by, by uh, Elizabeth Stein, certainly of its era, but she had a monumental impact for all of her students and for the larger community. In fact, I went to, to college with a scholarship uh, in part from Elizabeth Stein and something that's important to me still. Um, there is an intaglio print by Chao Wen Chen and uh, Chao Wen was a contemporary of mine, actually a little ahead of me in school at ISU. I knew him in the printmaking program uh, where he studied with uh, Ray George, and uh, the group of us would often do things together. Actually, uh, I remember going to Chicago to visit the River North Gallery District with Chow Wen and I think Joe Sim and Todd DeVries uh, and Dan Addington. Um, and we were at a at a pub in River North when when we were watching TV during our our lunch and and they first broadcast the crackdown in Tiananmen Square. And uh, Chao Wen, who was a Chinese national, you know, noted that he felt he could never go back to, to China after that. Uh, he's an amazing artist. He teaches at Alfred University, uh, does much more conceptual work now than he did then. But during his time here, he was uh, an amazing student, an amazing artist. I know for quite a while he also worked as a studio assistant for uh, Harold Greger, so uh, he, he uh, uh, just has always done terrific work, and so it's, it's, it's wonderful that we have a piece of his in our collection. There is a Ray George print, too, and, and it's a print that probably has some acrylic paint applied to the surface. Uh, Ray George was uh, probably the last faculty member at Illinois State University who actively smoked cigarettes in the classroom. <laughs> and uh, He was on my graduate committee and uh, a terrific artist. 
Uh, he always kept his, uh, his haircut from when he was in the Navy. I believe he was from Nebraska. There's a big Nebraska contingent uh, at ISU and actually in town as well. Uh, but that's a terrific print, and I can't look at that without thinking of all the various uh, prints and, and paintings that he had done during his time here, and actually invented some processes. Uh, he invented a collagraph uh, process where uh, a mesh fiber, actually uh, uh, nylon hose, were stretched over cardboard with uh, a gel medium to, to build up surface. He was always inventive and always supportive. And uh, uh, again, I think it's, he's an, a, an important artist, uh, a valuable artist to uh, continue to share to the community just because of the great work he had, but also the great impact he had on a lot of other artists. Todd DeVries. Uh, so we have a Todd DeVries. Actually, we have three or four uh, paintings or prints by Todd DeVries. Todd was also a contemporary of mine ahead of me in school. Uh, he was originally from the Peoria area. Uh, he went on, I believe he got his MFA from Ohio State University. Uh, for a while he was teaching in, in uh, the United Arab Emirate. Uh, he came back and was working as a, a department chair or dean of a college uh, where unfortunately he succumbed to a heart attack gosh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, Neva, who was another one of our, of our group, called me to let me know that he had passed, uh, leaving uh, his wife and a young son. So uh, a terrific artist and, and uh, a good friend. And so it's, it's nice that we have work of his in the collection as well. The Kevin Strandberg sculpture of the, uh, the big tornadoes and the illuminated house is actually from an exhibition we had here probably maybe 14 years ago. At the time, there was a board member who had suggested that we get more people in the uh, galleries if we did something with um, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, uh, L. Frank Baum, who wrote the Wizard of Oz series, was a Chicagoan, but his niece, who is buried at a cemetery here in town, where they have the cemetery walk, uh, was Dorothy, and so uh, he honored his niece by naming Dorothy Gale character uh, after her. Anyway, so we, we decided that we'd have a show related to The Wizard of Oz called Dorothy's Red Shoes, and a lot of artists, we probably had 70 artists in that exhibition, who all did work that was somehow thematically tied to uh, either the, the Wizard of Oz books or the film. And Kevin really went above and beyond and created this beautiful sculpture, which he uh, eventually gave to the Art Center, and which we've proudly had in our collection uh, for, for many, many years. And so it's a delight to show it again, especially in light of the fact that we'll be having a Kevin Strandberg show coming up in February here at the Art Center. The Lucille Bike painting was a recent acquisition from her estate. Lucille Bike was a, a lifelong painter. Uh, she passed away just within the last year in her 90s, but had played a significant role with the Art Center uh, for a long, long time. She had served on our board for many years and was actually board president uh, at one time. But even uh, as an elderly woman, she would attend every exhibition. She would come in and look at all of our shows and we would have great conversations and she always had keen insight into what artists were doing, and she was very interested in that. Uh, but what I hadn't known for all that time that we talked is that she was an active painter. So uh, it was lovely to receive several paintings that, uh, that she had created for a permanent collection so we can honor her legacy and the uh, enduring value of people that are seriously invested in uh, the painting process and lifelong learning. When you walk into the exhibition, you're instantly greeted by this incredible sculpture. It's small and unassuming, but it's quite impactful. It's entitled Child with Cat, and it is a 1927 work by Luthanian-born artist William Zorak. And this work is 
just fascinating to me. It is one of an addition of of at least eight known different variants, and they're, they exist from pink Tennessee marble to um, plaster with brown pentina. Ours that we have in house is bronze, but there's also different variations of that where it's polished bronze or polished bronze on a black stone base. So all of them are the same work essentially, but he was experimenting in a lot of different mediums. Uh, the one thing that does stay consistent in this work is his subject of his daughter and her name was DeLove, and this is his daughter and one of the family felines. And what's really interesting here to me is that this particular artist was really a romantic at heart, and you can see that expressed in this work so well. There's a couple dynamics at play. It's uh, something where you can see the love that the daughter has for this cat, but you're also seeing the love that he has for his daughter. And um, William as an artist, as a person, thought that love was basically the fuel for not only his artwork, but the fuel behind everything in life. Um, so you see a lot of this in his work and this one he's you know she's embracing the family pet but in many of his other works it's two people lovers embracing or two children embracing um, but you see this consistently throughout his work um, i love this quote by william he describes his work saying there is much of pain and exhalation in creative work a re resistless relentless power that makes one ever create. It is a sort of inner vision. It is seen with a timeless spirit. It is a love that is felt so intensely that the artist has to record it, to give it back to humanity. For love is not only getting, but giving. And I just love that quote from William. I think it shows so much um, of his inner workings as an artist and his motivation and drive. Um, William actually has such an exciting story as an artist. Uh, he originally was pursuing traditional school and in seventh grade, his teacher recognized his artistic ability and suggested that he go to art school immediately and act as an apprentice, which he did. And that's where he started studying printmaking, lithography, um, and, and excelled in that really. Um, the turning point in his artistic life where he decided to abandon painting and printmaking lithography was when he was carving a wood block and he realized he was fascinated with the actual act of carving that block in that 3D uh, tangible object uh, more so than the 2D print that would have subsequently been made. Um, I think it was an excellent choice for him. He has a huge body of work. He uh, started seeing that success around 1925, so about two years before uh, the particular sculpture we have in the house was produced. Uh, and uh, at the time in 1925, he had met with success um, for his sculpture entitled, I believe, Two Children, and it was a mahogany sculpture. Uh, but that is what gave him confidence to say, you know, I think I'm going to pursue sculpture full time. And so wonderful uh, pieces like the one we have in house were created from that decision. Um, the piece and the artist both have such fascinating stories. Uh, the piece is unique because it's one of a series of at least eight that exist in the world. Although those are in existence, I believe that this is the only one currently on display in the world right now. Uh, the Smithsonian does have one and is not currently on play on, on view. And that one is um, cast and painted plaster. Um, New York's Museum of Modern Art has one that William Carr from Pink Tennessee Marble. And the one we have in house is bronze, um, but there's also variations out there where you're seeing polished bronze. You're seeing polished bronze on a stone base. So he experimented um, with a lot of different mediums for this same sculpture.